Hey class, this is Professor Steve, and this is going to be our last stop in this unit for ocean circulation, only the second part, um, and that is atmospheric circulation. So uh, we've been building up learning about pressure centers, learning about the effect that Coriolis has um, on, on objects moving on a rotating plane, um, how that affects different pressure, pressure systems and how those those react, and now we need to learn a little bit about how that affects um, in turn, the, the the atmospheric circulation, and and all of this is really set up for the next unit, where we'll see how this interacts with the ocean to generate um, much of the surface ocean circulation. So we learned about um, flow due to pressure gradients, right? So anywhere there's a pressure gradient, the flow goes from high to low. Um, we learned about the two different types of pressure systems that we can have. We can have a high pressure center where flow is is initially away from the center from high to low, from high to low. Uh, but then Coriolis sets up a system where this continually rotates, right? This is a fluid medium moving from high to low on a rotating plane of, of, of reference, which is the Earth. And so it deflects to the right in the northern hemisphere going that way, to the right in the northern hemisphere that way, and sets up this whole rotational high pressure system, which is clockwise for a high pressure center, right? Um, and and the opposite for a low pressure center, where we have uh, high pressure on the outsides of the system, low pressure in the in the in the center, we have flow from high to low, high to low. We have deflection to the right of that direction this way, deflection to the right of that on this uh, um, to the right of this direction of this flow into the into the screen here, and that sets up a low pressure center, which is constantly flowing from high to low initially, but then curving to the right high to low, curving to the right, which sets up a counterclockwise low pressure um, circulation system. So we see this on on, um, on weather maps all the time. Uh, you know, wind that you feel when you go outside is driven by these processes. You can have a high pressure center where the, the wind is going from high to low, but spinning this way, and you can feel that wind. You can have a low pressure center where the wind is going from 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 high on the outside to low, um, which causes this to circulate this way, and you can feel wind that way. But the strongest winds are met when a high pressure system meets a low pressure system, and as you hopefully you could guess, which which where is the direction of this of that strong wind when these two systems meet? You should be saying right away that it's from high to low, right? So if you get a high pressure system moving in on a low pressure system, you get very strong winds between these two, and that's that's where we get our strongest storms, atmospherically speaking. But there's another dimension to all this. So here's our high pressure system, pressure center, doing its rotational thing. Here's our low pressure system doing its rotational thing. And you can see the mass transport of these of this air mo of these molecules or of, of of this system. It could be a water system, but we're talking about circulation in the atmosphere today. So the mass transfer of that air is actually going from high to low. But we see this vertical now um, dimension in this whole thing. And that is because in a low pressure center um, in the atmosphere, air tends to rise. And in a high pressure center, the air tends to sink. Now I'm going to explain to you um, in detail why that is, but one intuitive way to think about this, or, or at least a trick to remember it, is if you have a pile of air here, and let's say all air wants to rise, um, if, it, if there's a low amount of pressure pushing on that air, if it's too low, if it's low pressure, then it, it can rise. But if you have a high pressure center, then you can think of it as there's a lot of pressure keeping that air from coming up, and so the air sinks. That's just one one trick. I'm sure you could think of others. But really, it has to do with um, the laws of, air, of physics and how they relate to the air. <coughs> now, the pressure of air decreases with with altitude. So as air le um, as air rises, um, the pressure uh, decreases and and um, the density of that air also decreases and that means vice versa as air sinks the pressure on it increases and um, and the density of that air increases second rule that I want you to remember is an increase in temperature of air 
decreases the density, right? And we, if that go back to our density lesson when we talked about water, when you increase the temperature of anything, the um, energy between the bonds in the bonds between those two molecules increases, and there's less room for for molecules, for the number of molecules in that given volume, right? So hot air. Uh, a cubic liter of hot air holds less air molecules than a cubic liter of cold air, right? So that means vice versa. Hot hot air uh, is is less dense. Cold air is more dense. The other thing to remember, and this is counterintuitive, so it's it's opposite to what you might think, is humid air is less dense than dry air. Whoops, sorry about that. So let's think about why that is. And the, and the reason it's counterintuitive is if you think of a humid day, um, the air feels thicker. You feel like you're walking through water. You feel like you're having trouble breathing it in. And that's true because your lungs are designed to breathe air and not water. If you try to breathe underwater, you certainly are going to feel a lot thicker. But, but really, it's a very simple way of looking at it. And that is what is contained in, in air, one unit of air. It's made up of approximately 25% oxygen, uh, 20 uh, 70 percent nitrogen and 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 a whole bunch of hydrogen and there's some other stuff in there but it's minor so this is greater than 90 99 percent of what's in air and these guys don't exist on their own they exist in what's called a, a dye molecule so it's o2 two oxygens and two two nitrogens and two hydrogens so if you add that up the molecular weight of oxygen is 16 times 2 is 32 nitrogen is 14 times 2 is 28 hydrogen is 1 times 2 which is 2 and you add those together and you get 62 if you replace just one air molecule in a unit of of in a volume of of the atmosphere with one water molecule which is made up of H2O you only have one oxygen and two hydrogens so 16 plus 2 is 18 so it weighs less it's less dense so if you do the math, it makes sense. <coughs> so with those laws of air, uh, governing air physics in mind, if you have cold and dry and warm air, right? dry air, cold air is more dense than warm air, we said that. Dry air is more dense than humid air, we said that. So cold dry air sinks right so that's what you have in a high pressure system the air descends in a high pressure system if you have warm air which is less dense we said warmer gas is less dense and humid air wet air which we said is also less dense then you have a low pressure system right this air is less dense so it rises less dense will always rise above more dense just like the stratification of the ocean more dense sinks. Okay, so a high pressure system we have a sinking air. Low pressure system we have rising wet air. So if we go back to here, whoops, sorry. So if we go back to here, here's our sinking high pressure system, wet, and here's our rising ascending low pressure system, dry. Okay, so now if we start to apply this to the earth, we have, let's start at the equator. The equator is warm, wet air. So that's low pressure center, or low pressure belt around the entire equator. Low pressure, low density, it rises. Now once it gets to a certain point in the atmosphere, that area, that, that air has to go somewhere, and what does it do? Well, because of Coriolis, at the equator, Coriolis is zero, but up here it has to go somewhere, so it's, if, you, if you step off to the, to the southern hemisphere, it starts to deflect to this way. If you step off to the northern hemisphere, it starts to deflect this way. As it rises, um, the air cools a little bit, and as it travels along the top of the atmosphere, it cools even more. As it cools, it condenses, and rain comes out of the air. As it rain comes out of the air, it, it gets so. As it cools, it gets more dense. As rain comes out of the air, it gets more dense because the air. So now the air is getting cooler and drier. And once it gets cool and dry enough, it sinks again. So it's traveling this way, right, and this way, and it's getting cooler and drier, and it sinks around the Tropic of Can uh, Capricorn, ca traveling this way, and it sinks around the Tropic of Cancer. And it does this over and over again. So here's our equator. We have the rising air. We're just looking at the northern hemisphere now. right? We have this rising air, this divergence. It gets drier, and it sinks. And then it comes back on itself and feeds this recirculating atmospheric cell we call the Hadley cell. 
Now we get a similar um, occurrence in in the in the North Pole, right? At the North Pole, we have very cold, very dry air. So the air sinks in the beginning of this polar cell. As the air sinks here, it has to diverge away from itself at the surface. Some of it goes this way around the other side of the Earth, and some of it goes this way. As it gets um, more and more uh, south, it gets warmer and wetter. As it gets warmer and wetter, it becomes high pressure and it rises. And the same thing, the atmosphere circulates it back up this way. So we have this sinking circulation this way for the polar cell. We have this rising, moving, and sinking circulation for the Hadley cell. And what this does is cause a divergence this way here and a convergence this way here which sets up this center cell so these two rotate kind of like gears and drive along with the climate um, dry here um, <coughs> sorry yeah dry and and warm here or dry and cold here and warmer and and wetter here and so we get this middle feral cell so up here polar cell Hadley cell and they spin like gears and drive this feral cell so what does it look like um, on a flat surface. Here's the here's the equator, right? And that's we said low pressure, wet and warm. It rises. It rises and circulates towards the subtropical high, but when it drops, it towards the surface, it comes this way, right? So whoops. So the pressure goes from high to low. Let's go back, right? Along the surface, along the atmosphere, it's going this way, but along the surface, it's going from high to low. All right, that's really all you have to remember. If you remember that the equator is a low pressure system, and the subtropic is a high, and then there's a subpolar low, and then a polar high, and the same thing in the southern hemisphere, you have to remember that the flow goes from high to low, high to low, and then from here, high to low, high to low. But then you have to remember one other thing, right? And that is Coriolis. So it doesn't just go from high to low, but as it goes from high to low, it deflects to the right. Right now we're going down the screen, but if you were to turn your point of view going this way, to the right is this way. Going from high to low up the screen, deflected to the right. Going from high to low from the polar down the screen, deflected to the right. Okay, High to low, deflected to the right. High to low, deflected to the right. Same thing in the southern hemisphere, but deflected to the left. From high to low, deflected to the left. From high to low, deflected to the left. From high to low, deflected to the left. And this is really the basic pattern that we see in Earth's surface atmospheric circulation. And when we look at it in a three-dimensional way, here's our Hadley cell, here's our Ferrell cell, here's our polar cell. And the same thing going south, Hadley, Ferrell, polar. Near the surface, <coughs> the flow is deflected this way, but deflected to the right deflected this way from high to low but deflected to the right deflected this way is uh, driven from high to low but deflected to the left in the southern hemisphere and to the right in the northern hemisphere now what this also does is set up some very long-term um, uh, climate phenomenon such as the ITC or the intertropical convergence zone now this is continual this continual updraft of, of um, of warm humid air along the equator sets up this this convergence zone which is constantly wet and constantly as as the air is moving away it's constantly raining and you can see that from a satellite and it's long term and persistence and sometimes it shifts north a little sometimes it shifts south south a little but it essentially makes the the areas around the equator always have this cloud belt to some degree and always wet and rainy especially over here near the continent where it can where it can pick up speed um, another example of the way the um, these um, high and low belts and and the persistent uh, global wind patterns set up a uh, permanent uh, phenomenon is it can be seen by our deserts. Um, so we have the dry sinking air along these belts um, and since there's no moisture in these belts uh, if the if the um, conditions are right, you get along these belts where the, this dry sinking air, you, you get continually dry climate and you can have, um, 
you can have things like a desert set up, especially along a long stretch of ground where there's no moisture coming in from the ocean, like, like across the Saharan and the Arabian areas. Okay, thanks for joining me. See you next lesson.